Here they come. Welcome to a new season of Here They Come. I'm Paul Ramlo, and I'm pleased to introduce our new co-host for the 2011-2012 season, Jessica Schroeder. Welcome aboard, Jessica. Hi, Paul. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Jessica, why don't you introduce yourself to the folks? Tell us a little bit about your background. Okay. Um, I actually grew up in a harness racing family. Both of my grandfathers raced, and my mom and I still do. We uh, race at the county fairs in Wisconsin and Illinois and also in Chicago, and I actually now have some horses here in Ohio. And Jessica, you've worked here at the USTA for three years now. Tell us a little bit about your duties. Okay. I actually am the outreach administrator, so I travel a lot during the summer and the fall mostly, um, representing the USTA at major sales and races. So it's great to meet a lot of our members who I've talked to on the phone but haven't had a chance to meet face-to-face -face yet. Well, great. And Jessica, hopefully you'll be here with us every other week for throughout the winter season of Here They Come. We'd also like to take the opportunity to, on camera, introduce you to the third member of our group, our producer, Rich Johnston. Hi, Rich. Hi, Paul. How you doing? How you doing, folks? Good to be here. Yes, uh, I produce the show. I do all the multimedia stuff. Uh, you also might see me out at the track doing all the video work. So uh, we should have a good year here in 2011-2012. Uh, Kicking off this week's show, Jessica, we're going to talk a little bit about the Dan Patch balloting. Uh, the members of the United States Harness Riders Association and North American Racing Secretaries will be receiving their ballots in the mail in the not-too-distant future to vote for the 12 divisional honors for the Dan Patch Awards, as well as Trotter of the Year, Pacer of the Year, and Horse of the Year. Now, we don't have time to talk about all 12 categories, but there are three that I think are pretty contentious this year, so we'll touch a little bit on those, Jessica. Okay. Starting off with the three-year-old Colton Gelming Pacers. Uh, tell us what your thoughts are. Well, it was a hotly contested division, I thought, um, but I think my go-to horse is gonna have to be Roll With Joe. The Cam's Card Shark Colt had an amazing year. He raced well throughout the year, not just a late bloomer or an early comer. Um, racing in the Meadowlands pace at some beach somewhere, so he showed that he can go on a lot of different tracks and a lot of different places. Um, and I must say, I'm, I'm a bit of a baseball fan, so I had to do my batting average, and he had a 635 batting average, which I thought was pretty impressive. Yeah, Rolla Joe definitely should be the favorite. He earned more than $500,000 more than the nearest competitor, which was up the credit. Uh, both of those horses, of course, winning million-dollar races up the credit, the North America Cup, Rolla Joe, the Meadowlands pace. Uh, there's going to be some other horses, I think, that are going to get some play. Better than Cheddar, who won the Breeders' Crown and the Cane Pace, should get some votes. Uh, Big Bad John, who was awfully impressive in winning the Little Brown Jug. I, I think uh, there's going to be those horses, maybe even a couple more, will get some consideration. But I think Roll with Joe is certainly the morning line favorite. What do you think, Rich? Well, we spent a lot of time with uh, Ed Hart, the uh, trainer of Roll with Joe, and uh, you know what a great individual he is. And I thought Roll with Joe had a fantastic year, also in Meadowlands Pace and. Uh, some of the other big races. Now three Colt Trot is another one that I think is going to be awfully hard to come up with one horse. Uh, I was going through the major stakes this year and I think Man of Many Missions was the only horse that won two major stakes winning the Kentucky Futurity and the Colonial Trot. Uh, Broad Bond wins the Hamiltonian which of course was an awfully impressive performance that day. Uh, DeJarnbro won the Earl Beale, Chapter 7 the Breeders Crown. How do you see this race playing out Jessica? This one is really tough. I think there's probably four, five, six horses that easily could uh, be in contention. Um, I'm going to have to again look at the first in earnings was Broad Bond with uh, $1.3 million. You, you can't dispute the money earnings there. Um, the horses that for me have the top batting average, DeJarnbro batted a 7.10 which I thought was really impressive. And then you got to look at their marks. Man of Many Missions out at the Meadowlands trotting in 52-1 and one was a pretty impressive mark too so I think any of these horses could be top contenders. Yeah, I think for me, the one race I just seem to remember as I look back on that class this year is the Kentucky Futurity and what a great race off that was for Manny Mini Missions. And I just think we wouldn't even be having this conversation if it wasn't for a couple of untimely breaks by that horse and a couple other major races, especially the Hamiltonian. This one, I think, is going to be one of the closest divisions uh, we've had in many recent years. If you had to vote, Rich, what would you do? I would probably go man of many missions. I thought the change from uh, the driver Andy Miller to David Miller was uh, the big factor for this horse. Uh, he just kept breaking and breaking, and when they put uh, David Miller on man of many missions, you know, it was lights out from there on. I I'd vote for man of many missions. One other category that I think is going to be very interesting is older pacing horse because there are two fantastic horses and we will see and foiled again. I really feel, Jessica, whoever wins this division is going to be pacer of the year. What do you think? I can't 
agree with you more. Um, foiled again, he's a tough old horse that uh, just keeps improving. He made $1.4 million this year, which is pretty impressive. Um, and the list of his stakes wins this year is just reads like the book of the biggest stakes that there are. Um, the Graduate, the Molson, the Battle of Lake Erie, which for me as an Ohio person now is a pretty big race. The American National out at Balmoral. Um, and we will see, I think, for taking it on as a four-year-old who, you know, a lot of people say four-year-olds can't compete with the older horses. I think he showed that he could. And I think he would be big in contention winning those big races out in Kentucky. The All Ridge and the Ben Franklin out at Chester is amazing. Yeah, it's going to be some interesting balloting. All the finalists, actually the divisional honors, will be announced on the Tuesday after Christmas, December 27th, while Trotter of the Year, Pacer of the Year, and Horse of the Year will be announced at the Dan Patch Dinner in Florida in February. Well, Jessica, while the Dan Patch Awards are voted upon by members of the U.S. Harness Riders Association, every racing fan can have their say in a couple of awards that are put on by the USTA and the U.S. Harness Riders Association, and that's the third annual Railbird Recognition Awards. Yeah, it's great. It's a great idea because fans can vote on the, their favorite racing moment from 2011 and also their choice for Horse Person of the Year um, for 2011. And for the first time, you at home can vote right on our USTA homepage in the lower right-hand corner using our poll section of the website. Yeah, the first poll, which is going on right now, is for the uh, racing moment of the year. And then starting on December 16th through the end of December, you'll be able to vote for the Horse Person of the Year. So we encourage everyone to go to ustrotting.com and vote in the Railbird Recognition Awards. Well, Jessica, earlier this week we got a press release from Jeff Gorell talking more about his hope that we can get four-year-olds back on the racetrack by eliminating their ability to stand stud, at least in races that would be held at Vernon, Tioga, and the Meadowlands. Uh, Jeff wanted to implement that with the upcoming 2012 breeding season, but now he's decided to hold it off for one more year. Yeah, and I think a big part of that was the level of continuity because he's got some other groups like WEG and the Hamiltonian Society that were also thinking about implementing this rule. But WEG wasn't going to start it until Foles of 2014 and the Hamiltonian Society possibly Foles of 2015. So I think holding off another year will keep it more in line with those other groups that are considering these rule changes as well. Yeah, I think Jeff's other consideration was, A, he said he didn't have enough time to really get the language implemented in this. And he also wanted to make clear one thing. He's not saying a lifetime ban for horses that start standing stud with their four-year-old season. He only wants that one first year to be a, a ban. They would be allowed to have their horses eligible for those major races at age five and above. And Jeff has an interesting idea, another way to why he, how he can keep four-year-olds on the racetrack. Yeah, he's talking about creating some series with the different stake sponsors so that then four-year-olds will be, there will be a better four-year-old staking season where four-year-olds can race against four-year-olds, which I think is a big component of this so that then they're more encouraged to stay racing at four because they're not going to have to go against five, six, and seven-year-olds right off the bat. Yeah, as we talked earlier about we will see what a fantastic four-year-old season he had. That's been more the exception than the rule as far as success at four. This would give the four-year-olds an opportunity to race against their same kind for the first few months of a, a racing season before they have to go out and tackle the older horses in the, in the summer season. It'll be interesting to see how this plays out. This is certainly uh, something that I, I'm in favor of. I want to see more four-year-olds racing. Having a horse like Sand Pale race later, you know, continue to go on and probably be horse of the year this year. I mean, it, it's a great opportunity, I think, for all the fans to keep these horses on the racetrack. Well, Paul, about this time last year, I found out that I had won a trip to France for the Prix de Marique at the end of January through a raffle from the Standard Red Retirement Foundation, which was a fabulous experience, and I recommend anybody that's watching to get tickets and try and win this prize. Yeah, I've never had the opportunity to go to France, but Dean Hoffman, who hosts the tour every year, has spoken in glowing terms about what a great time it is how outstanding a race it is, and so many other things that you can do. Tell us a little bit about what you did there in addition to going to the Prix de Marique. Well, not only do you get to do everything horsey, like go to the race, and then you also get to go to a major horse sale, and then you also get to go to Grabat Training Center, but you get a guided tour of the city. You can see all of the big things, the Sacre Coeur, the Louvre, um, all the big things that you think of when you think France, um, obviously the Eiffel Tower. Um, and a great opportunity to not only get a trip for yourself, but to support the Standard Retirement Foundation, all the things that they do for our retired racehorses. Make sure you visit adoptahorse.org for more information on the trip, and good luck. And the drawing is this coming Friday, December 9th, so get your tickets now. Well, that wraps up this week's edition of Here They Come. I'd like to thank our producer, editor, and part-time co-host, Rich Johnston. 
I'm Paul Ramlow. And I'm Jessica Schroeder. Join us again in two weeks for the next episode of Here They Come. <laughs>